Let's get started. We'll go ahead. Let's see. It's, let's turn it up. Here we go. We'll start in just a moment. So everybody will kind of get the coats off, Miss Valencia, and get. I know. <laughs> Okay, let's go ahead and call our meeting to order for the House Education Committee. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna just, I was just going to mention that, Mr. Floor Leader. Um, but first, uh, to get our meeting started off right, I'm going to call on Chairman Benton to start with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Grace Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day. We ask that you... Uh, bless this meeting and, and those that are about to be a part of it, whether they are uh, the committee or those out in the audience listening. We ask that you watch over us and uh, give us guidance as we, as we go about the business of the state. When we're finished, we ask that you give us traveling mercies as we go back to our homes. And these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Yes, sir. Uh, floor Leader Lurica. You know, Chairman Benton's already said, I, I'm between him and lunch. And I'm between you and Douglas. I understand, you know, and I, but I appreciate everybody showing up today. 14, somebody got a, qu I got a question? Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, is there a sign-up sheet for public comment? This is a full committee meeting. We don't do that. Okay. And so I appreciate that and um, appreciate y'all being here. Okay, well, We'll move on to the bills without delay. We'll call on Chairman Dickey first. He has House Bill 1026. Oops, sorry. Members of uh, the committee, um, uh, in front of you is House Bill 1026. It's uh, just two very minor changes. If you recall, last year we passed Senate Bill 83 that codified our uh, wonderful REACH program uh, in code, made lots of um, uh, things to that bill that, that sort of set up uh, our REACH program going forward. And, um, and due to our limited uh, budget restrictions this year and, and, and the growth of the REACH program, um, we want to revise a couple of things in, um, in our REACH program uh, from our larger systems uh, from 12 down to eight scholars and for our smaller systems from uh, to uh, from seven down to five reach scholars and uh, it's a great program we want to keep it financially uh, strong and viable going as y'all many of you know this program is a partnership between state local and foundation and uh, this just uh, minor adjustments just keeps it within the uh, the boundaries of our budget Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Got a quick 19. Is that right here? Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to thank uh, Chairman Dickey for bringing this bill. I've actually participated in the REACH program as a mentor for the last three years, and I've had uh, four students per year, and I'm tracking those students through high school. So thank you for bringing this. Well, thank you. Yeah. And a big part of that program is the mentorship pro uh, part of it for these, uh, for these scholars in high school to be able to go on to college or technical school. Thank you. 15, is that Representative Evans? Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, and I wanted just to ask a few questions. Um, uh, as far as the REACH program, how many students are, were in the program last year? Um, Thank you. The program was started in 2012, mm -hmm. and um, and I think uh, our goal is to, we're up to about 150 school systems throughout our state. We're not quite at the 180, uh, but I think we have almost uh, 3,000 students now. They they were first given these scholarships in eighth grade, so those people uh, proceed on through. We had our first. 
uh, actual students last year received those scholarships on that first year in 2012. So the program is escalating the number of scholars are, are increasing and then it will plateau off uh, at some point here. So un unless uh, we, we try to expand it a little bit more um, later. Yes, 150 school systems and, and about how many students? I or? think about 3,000. 3, yeah. I don't have the exact number. I Chairman Chokas. At the appropriate time, sir. Okay, I see another question here. I think Representative Stovall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm um, sorry, um, Chairman Dickey. I wasn't at the subcommittee. I didn't stay. Um, but what was the reason for reducing the number? Uh, just budget restrictions. Okay. As you know, uh, we, we um, the local school systems uh, are responsible for about 25 percent, uh, and um, and some of them are having a little bit of hard tr trouble in our uh, smaller counties and, and less affluent counties. And uh, then we have a foundation that raises some money statewide. They are charged with 25% and then a state. And so uh, with our budget, we just um, have not uh, grown it. So the Department of um, Student Finance was concerned about where we were going to get the finances to do if, if some of these uh, other school systems came in with with those larger numbers. And so we just try, we can move it back later, I hope mm -hmm. to, um, but this is uh, just something we needed to do on, in the interim to be able to make sure we had enough money. When we promised those students that, uh, that scholarship in eighth grade to be able to come through uh, when they go off to college and technical school. Okay, thank you. Floor leader. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Former representative and chairman of Motor Vehicles, Bubber Epps' uh, wife, uh, is passionate about the REACH program, and she will make me quote to her, realizing educational achievement, you know, can happen. And she'll, she'll just grill me on that. And so on her behalf, <laughs> I just, I, listen, we all get what's going on with the budget, but she's going to ask me about it, and I'm going to say, yes, ma'am, we'll keep an eye on that. And make sure we'll do all that we can. So I just wanted to say something for her. Well, thank you. She is, she and uh, former uh, representative are very passionate and worked in Twiggs County. And was, uh, that's where this program is really making the difference in these smaller counties, these students. He, she tells me the story of a young boy in eighth grade who were struggling in school, got this scholarship, and by 12th grade was a valedictorian of that, of that uh, graduating class out of Twiggs County. So that's the kind of, um, changes uh, and, and results you get out of this REACH program. Yeah, I think, you know, any of the committee members haven't been to one or not invited, it's just a great opportunity. What's the will of the committee? On? Do pass. No, excuse me. Joke, got a second? Second. Okay. All in favor of this measure, aye. Aye. Any opposed? Slight sign. Thank you very much. Go. Chairman Dickey, thank you for all your work on the K-12 budget. I know you've been working very hard, uh, and we appreciate the work you're doing. I think the committee's going to be pleased. Yay. Next up, Chairman Benton. Do you want to go from there, or do you want to sit? Okay. Wants everybody to stare him in the eye. In a loving way, <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Back up there. Still might be some people who want to shoot at <laughs> Chairman Dickey has a sub. You got it in your folder? Yeah. We're working from LC 490181S. <clears throat> uh, ladies and gentlemen of the committee, this, this, I know you'll notice that this has a very low number, uh, House Bill 86. This was a bill that we uh, passed out of this committee last year, and it uh, got to rules and, and got hung up right at the end, and we tried to add it to a couple of Senate bills, and it just didn't work out. And so... Uh, we're back again this year to try to get this uh, to move forward. Uh, right now, uh, your, your teachers go through evaluations uh, during the year and then they have a final evaluation. Uh, at this point, they do not have uh, uh, a review for that performance evaluation. Uh, in other words, they, they, um, 
they cannot request a review uh, if, they, if they get a uh, unsatisfactory. And uh, we see this as one of the reasons that uh, a lot of a lot of young teachers, uh, those that are tenured, just just becoming tenured, leave the profession because uh, they they see that uh, they they have limited rights or uh, have limited or no rights for input in classroom discipline, evaluation, review, and other critical factors. Uh, as a former educator, I I feel like that this is this really is one of the reasons that we're having trouble getting uh, educated uh, uh, people to go into education because of the, the, the things that they see on TV or, or, or read about as far as uh, discipline uh, in schools and in the classroom. Uh, this gives the local system uh, the ability to construct a review process with emphasis on a non-burdensome -bur process for all parties, a reasonable timeline, and a mechanism to have a fair intervention from a uh, neutral third party if that's deci decided to, to be that way. This is a mechanism to enhance the professional side of teaching and education in general. Many educators both leaving and remaining in the profession complain of the current rigid law regarding evaluations. Uh, this has been witnessed by the Department of Education as well as local systems, associations, and other education establishments. The Department of Education last year came in and uh, in the subcommittee and supported the bill. Uh, they have recognized a number of uh, number of calls and complaints to their offices involved offices involved in the evaluation process. There is no fiscal component to the bill. It is not a grievance bill. Uh, the unsatisfactory rating is only given at the end of the year in a uh, in a summative evaluation, and so. We are simply asking that uh, the, the bill move forward that would allow teachers to have some input uh, when they receive a uh, unsatisfactory evaluation. Maybe they've gone through the whole year and gotten nothing but uh, satisfactory or whatever. I can't remember what the, the, the ratings are, but uh, they get to the end and then they get unsatisfactory and they have no appeal for that. And so. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll be glad to take any questions. I'll try to answer them. Uh, I have a couple, or just one right now. Representative Glanton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman, Ben, uh, just a question. Uh, was there any discussion, and you know, you can make me smart about this, uh, were there any discussion in regards to uh, requesting an evaluation, whether it's unsatisfactory or not? For instance, in the military, we had annual reviews and regardless of whether it was a negative review or a positive review, they had to tell us where we are, what we're doing, how well we're doing, and those things that we need to improve upon. Those, those things are done during the year. Okay. And so uh, it, this, this is just the final evaluation that we're, we're looking to have. Uh, in other words, during the year, their uh, teachers are told, you know, you're, you're doing this good, you're not doing it good, just need to work on uh, different things in the classroom or uh, and so forth but it's the last evaluation that is what we're looking for all right thank you see no other questions it's will of the committee do pass. I do pass have a second second all those in favor aye, aye. any opposed have one no thank you your bill passes thank you appreciate it Next, uh, we'll swap seats with uh, Vice Chairman Chokas, and I'll present House Bill 1055. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, we're happy to hear you present, uh, I think that's a sub for House Bill 1055. Okay, thank you. Thank you, committee. Um, you have a substitute. It's a, 
0214S, uh, just, just a few differences than what I presented in subcommittee. But I'll kind of go over the whole bill, so I think you want me to, and I think it, we all deserve to kind of hear what, what, what I'm attempting to accomplish here, and I hope um, uh, I do or have done a good job. You know, it's trying to come to a resolution of an issue that we've heard about for the last 10 years since I've been here and even before. And it's homeschool participation in extracurricular activities in public schools. I want to try to create a bill that would attempt to satisfy the needs of the schools, enable students to be actively be a part of that school. You know, I like many of you have received emails to do something to try to open this up. Uh, homeschool students may have played recreation or travel ball with a student that attended the school and then stop when the school becomes competitive or when sports become competitive or sometimes it's the only activity offered in the community band, one act play, whatever. So sports are not all that I'm talking about here. Like many of you, I did not see a way that this could work. Uh, and I've heard from schools and school systems and administrators and associations and, and others and, uh, you know, the comments, well, they're not, not, not good enough for our school to be in. Why should they be allowed to pers participate? And, um, you know, I'm pretty honest about stuff. And I think the committee knows that. And so I uh, just kind of tried to look at it and thought about it a lot. I had members asked me to think about it. A Num number of different people asked me to look at it. So kind of took it on this summer and fall to look and see what I could come up with. And, um, and then started thinking about it, talking to different people. And when you really look at schools today, they're not like they were five years ago when my kids were in high school or 10 years ago or 40 years ago when I was. And you're very different. You know, we've got Besides home schools, charter schools, magnet schools, private charter, public charter, private, dual enrollment, alternative academies, you see it's different. And um, during subcommittee, I think you heard uh, Robin Hines from GHSA, very nicer than I said, it's a different world out there. And uh, we need to consider that. You know, we now have high school students who do not attend or darken the doors of their high school you know, with dual enrollment. And, uh, or, and or apprenticeships. So the goal is to create a platform and I wanted to see that I could, if I could do it. And that's how I took it on and with the help of legislative counsel and innumerable different folks, uh, I tried and we'll see how it goes. You know, during the testimony, I think the school groups that were there talked about our cooperative nature of the work and the spirit of the bill. They offered some idea, additional ideas in the last day or two and we worked on them also. And I tell you, you've got to really always thank Legislative Council and all these different folks. I think, thank you Mr. Walker, I uh, think we're on our fifth version of this it's in the last month or so. So how to come up with the idea, you know, that I talked about. One, we had been to a virtual school demonstration um, Representative Jones and I and a bunch of different ones that went to one with Arizona State. Kind of got me thinking about it. And I was telling my school superintendent about it in a rural development council meeting that I was planning in Jasper. And uh, happened to be an athletic director was there and he just said, well, why don't you do that? And he said, what do you mean? And so he suggested that, you know, what if a student was a participant in our or systems virtual school and then they could participate in our, our system? Would that work? And I said, well, I don't know, but I'll take it and see. So I give um, my school superintendent and athletic director credit, though my school superintendent was fired about three weeks ago, not for this, for some other reason, just a personal thing up there. But, you know, he was a very visionary man that really looked across a lot of things and, and thought it would do that. So here's what the bill does. If you'll look at yours, I'll kind of go through it <coughs> and uh, give you, you know, what, I think Bill does get the wrong one here. So, like I said, it's gonna allow a student to take a virtual class at the school system they reside in. And in doing so, they're part of the school that can participate in the extracurricular activities. So now, I will say on line 16, I did change the name from Tim Tebow, I can't do that, Georgia fan, you know, I, I would, if I could think of a better one, I would do that. 
jump over there on the next page. We've got a lot of definitions, which uh, we had to do. You know, talking about athletic associations, describing them, describing core subjects. You know, these are the ones that uh, the the um, virtual school should would be in. You know, English, reading, language arts, math. You know, the the normal stuff that we all talk about. You know, describes extra extracurricular activities. Described everyone we could think of. I think we've got good check on that one. Describes homeschool students. In your copy that you have, I'm going to change that uh, when at the appropriate time, Mr. Chairman. I've got six through twelve. It needs to be eight through twelve uh, when I talk to folks. In forty, in different, we look on uh, forty-two. It's interscholastic activities. Forty-six, we talk about the qualifying online course that's through our state virtual school or one facilitated by the resident school. Um, we look at you know what resident school is and what the resident school system is. Fifty-three, we talk about how they should be eligible. You know, it's pretty clear down through the next few lines. Uh, really clear how they become eligible. You know, 30 days, they're gonna to have to do something in writing to the school system. The written notice will, you know, um, what they wanna do, what sports they wanna participate in, because they, that school needs that communication between the student and the school. And it starts creating, I think, a good communication tool. You know, you look there, they're gonna to have to show, improve, and produce their annual progress assessment report Homeschool people, you know, students and parents do this every year annually. It's nothing unusual, nothing different. It's they got to show what's going on. If you look down there on 76, or it might be right before, no, it's on 71, we're saying that they will take one online course, just one, to be a participant. Now, they might be doing something in somewhere else, with a dual enrollment with somebody else, but this is specifically an online course with the school, making it very clear it's with the school. It talks about lineup and timing. Um, you look on, I think it's, I've got two, I'm going off two here, uh, that they have to, on 71, take a class in the preceding semester before participation. Now, some have said give me a little bit hard time about that, but that's going to I think gives everybody a time to make get in the game, be a part of the system to make work, and then on line seventy six just one. You know, we went to a lot of trouble uh, making sure that we were clear that the homeschool student would be treated just like any other student, and also be like any other student. And that there's a two things going there. They're going to be treated, but they've got to act like and, and accept, you know, the rules of the school, uh, discipline, whatever, uh, everything about it. They also have to be selected uh, to participate. If it's a cut sport, um, you know, school boards have a hard time with this, this bill in general, because they know if um, Rick is selected as a homeschool student and cuts out Tim, Tim's mother immediately is going to be at the school board complaining about this. That is an absolute fact and that will happen and uh, I understand that there's thoughts that you know a school system should be able to opt in or opt out of that and that's just uh, of this whole idea and that, that's out there. You look on line 92, you know, we kind of really keep with Georgia High School. If you withdraw, you're, you're out for a year. Coming in or out of school, that's what they do. Makes good, good sense. Line 103 is a clear statement that they shouldn't be denied participation. And again, on 108, we'd say the same thing. And 114, the key part is the payment. Looking at using the one-sixth day or block scheduling, you know, one fourth of that to fund this you know because there are there are, you know people will say well there's no cost well there are costs and we know there are costs and can't put our head in the sand and the this will allow schools to draw down some money for that participation and so that's the bill and when I was uh, thinking about it last night I wrote down is it perfect no 
Probably not. There are probably some nuances that, that will come about as people talk about it. And if we're fortunate enough to move this you know, to, the, to the House floor and then to the Senate and then on, there will be other little issues that you'll come up with. And when you think about it more, think about it at night, um, that you'll bring up to me. And, uh, and I've been trying to be very open about it and, and uh, thoughtful. And I'll be glad, Mr. Chairman, now to, to attempt to answer any questions. Uh, Thank I you, bet. Mr. Chairman. We have a few questions. Actually, the board lit up. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I think number 16 was first. Uh, thank you, Chairman, for uh, addressing this issue. Uh, one of my questions you answered, and I was concerned whether uh, a student that was, it was their home school, how they would be affected if a, a, a home study student was uh, accepted onto a team and that student that is physically enrolled wasn't. So you addressed that, but that definitely was a concern. The other question that I have for you really came from uh, someone that visited me about a similar issue and I'm just wondering would a home student, a home study student be affected? There's a clause in the uh, academic, the athletic association that does not allow students who have been trained by a coach at a receiving school in a somewhat of an intramural uh, area that they would not be able to participate in that school if they transferred into the school. How would that play into a homeschooled student who may have been uh, trained or uh, or coached by the coach in that school that is now being accept, uh, accepted? Because it seems, I don't know if it'll affect if the homeschooler could get in, but a student physically, again, that transferred in that had a relationship, if they wouldn't. I didn't know how that would affect as well. Thank you, ma'am. I think it's pretty clear in here that you know, there'll be a part of the school. The school is a member of the Georgia High School Association. Yes. So then they will follow the rules that the Georgia High School Association creates specifically about the case you're talking about. Okay. Uh, would be, they would be prohibited under their rules wow. right now. Okay. Now, I'm not an expert on their rules. Gotcha. But that's okay. the way I understand it. Thank you. Let's go to number 18. Number 18. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Jaspers, appreciate it your efforts on this. I know this has been something that we've been trying to find the balance on for a lot of years. Um, I wanted to get your thoughts, I, and I would remind committee members as we've talked about this, um, you know, when you think about the impact of, of home study programs on our school system, you know, one thing I think sometimes people overlook is for every homeschool student um, in our state, in their, for their respective county, you know, the county has a duty to, in fact, the state has a duty to provide a, a free and adequate education for all children in our state. That's a state duty. That's a partnership financially between our state and by our counties. And for every student that could matriculate in August and go to school and draw down $8,000 of roughly of money, um, some local, some state, and, and participate in, in a school bricks and mortar for the year, every student that, whose parents choose to homeschool them um, th what they're really doing is they're taking the cost on themselves. Um, they're not charging the state of Georgia $4,000 of QBE funds through our formula, and they're allowing the, the, the local government who's raised money through our school to add valorum taxes to keep all the money that's been levied to educate the child, but there's no child to educate. So what happens is every student, that, isn't it true, Mr. Chairman, that, that chooses whose parents choose to homeschool them, allow, for, for rough numbers, if the local funding raised per student is $4,000 at the local level per year, allow that $4,000 of local ad valorem taxes that was levied locally to educate that kid, allows that money to stay in the school system, but there's no kid they have to educate. So for every student that choose, whose parents choose to home educate them, it's raising the per pupil funding per year of the other kids in the district because there's more dollars and there's one less kid to educate. There's the same number of dollars and there's one less kid to educate. I say all that as to, to committee members as they consider this, 
because homeschool student, students are financially tremendously beneficial to the system because every one of those kids could show up on August 1st and take the local tax money. There'd be a duty to educate that kid with local tax dollars and with money from our state treasury. So there's a tremendous financial benefit, isn't it true, Mr. Chairman, that all the years the kids chosen to be home educated by their parents, that, that was a free benefit available to the parents that's never been availed of, and that's been to the benefit, financial benefit of the system and the, and the other kids. Would you agree with that, Mr. Chairman? In a way, Chairman Sessler, you know, the school system's supposed to budget based on needs and population based on theirs. And so, you know, I know what you're saying, and I agree there's a certain portion of that ad valorem local dollars that is just being claimed. But generally, the school system's doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're supposed to be taking their numbers and their needs and creating that tax bill, which we all argue with them a lot. And they do plan that. I, I, I agree, and I think that they're mindful of that. I, but I think the point, point I'm making, Mr. Chairman, is is that the the 50 or 60,000 students around the state who who are homeschooled or whatever that number is, if they all showed up on August 1st, it would be a, a back-breaking cost to the state and local governments to, to educate those kids. And what I'm, what I'm seeing in your bill is a recognition that if they want to show up and participate in a meaningful way in one class, that the benefits outside of just the classroom benefits of, of education can be enjoyed by kids. Um, without having to have the school district and the state incur the full burden if they all showed up and asked for a full, full-time full education. So but to me, this is, this is a recognition of the tremendous financial impact that homeschool families have to the benefit of every public school kid in the state uh, by virtue of there being more dollars to go around for them um, per pupil. And I think that that's an important point to make here, so I appreciate your, your bringing this. Um, Technical question for you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and if I could. Um, if a student who had been in high school, in a traditional high school, for example, in their junior, say their senior year, um, took one class at their traditional high school and took three classes, or if it's a block schedule, maybe two classes dual enrollment at the, at the local technical college, um, by virtue of taking one class at their traditional high school, could they not still participate in sports? They didn't withdraw, if I'm not mistaken, what you're asking. They never withdrew they from never school. Withdrew. That, that's correct. They've never withdrawn. They're still in their high school. They're still going to walk the stage. They're, They're taking one class in high school. The other classes are off at the technical college. They're happen. still able to participate. Are they not? Absolutely. That happens every day right okay, now. Sir. So the thing I like about your bill, Mr. Chairman, is this allows kids who have been homeschooled or are in a homeschool status, in essence, to participate in the same way, in essence, that kids who are taking dual enrollment classes off campus, they're, they're, they're in the system for one class, or more potentially, um, but most of their education is happening through some other system that's not the traditional local school. Yes, sir. So would you agree that's, yeah, that's somewhat agree. consistent? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman Setzler. I would like to interject with the other questions to be mindful of the time because some of us have a ways to go. Uh, number 14. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to hopefully be a lot more briefer than Chairman Sessler was, but uh, uh, all due respect, sir. Um, <laughs> uh, Chairman, Chairman Jaspers, thank you very much for bringing this bill. Um, uh, there are a number of, of homeschool families uh, in my district who are hoping to take advantage of this, some of whom are sitting right behind you. Um, and and uh, are grateful for you for bringing this. My question is about some of the changes that were made in the substitute. I just want to try to understand. Sure. Um, for example, on line 40, uh, you um, the substitute originally limited uh, 6th through 12th grade, and now you have suggested 8th yes. through 12th grade. Can you talk about sure. that change? I think uh, – School Superintendent Association uh, really wanted, uh, met with me that eighth grade is when they become, I guess my goal this whole thing was this was a high school bill. And I, they felt that I needed, my original bill that had no grade in it whatsoever. And in the sub, I, you know, I just said, okay, let's address that. But I, in my ignorance, put six through uh, 12. They said, really, high school, remember, they're going to, you're not right, you know, 
corrected me, educated me that you know people are participating in these high school sports. Many of them attempt participate in the eighth grade in the JV level. Do you think that there is the the potential to expand that to sixth and seventh grade in the future? Because I know that there are some feeder type mm -hmm. programs that this may. At this, I'd into. love to see it eight. I think they're they felt very comfortable with being eight at this moment, if it's so right with the committee. My other question, Mr. Chairman, is on line 82 and 83. Sure. Uh, you added in, I think maybe this was just left out of the original bill, but adding, adding in disciplinary measures. And it was. Yes, sir. Thank you for a sharp eye. If you looked right above um, on line 78, it says that. It says disciplinary. It just did not. They wanted to make it uniform, but thoughtful. Sharp eyes on your and their part. Thank you, sir. All right, thank you. Number one, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, uh, Representative uh, Wilson asked one of my questions on this issue of the uh, sixth grade, eighth grade, and so you, you, you partly answered it the way that I need to understand it, but in Coffee County, the largest county in the district that I serve, it, their middle school is 6th, 7th, and 8th. And a lot of schools are either 7th and 8th or 6th, 7th, and 8th. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it would only, and again, I'm not, I'm not suggesting some change or amendment, but I would, I would almost rather just leave it 6th through 8th. I really am not in here deciding this because of what GHSA thinks. I really, well, I don't is, think they was, do their own rules right. This I, will I, suit the superintendents, not okay. the, the high school. <laughs> <laughs> but but when, down in these rural areas especially, we have a elementary, a middle, and a high. Right. And almost all of our middles are grouped together with more than just an eighth grade. And so that was my thinking about okay. it. Same question, different reason. Sure. Uh, but also, just for curiosity, why does it spell six and then write the number 12? That just throws me off. Uh, you know, that, that's <laughs> a, that is a um, – I learned that. And I'll have is that one of them commas or the apostrophes like y'all were I'll, talking I'll, about? Uh, I'll, let's, see, let's see if I answer this right, <laughs> Mr. Legislative Council, that in primary numbers one through nine, you write them out, okay. and above, you don't. My, is that right? And to make it more complicated, unless the number is the first word of the sentence. So even if oh. it's Yeah. <laughs> oh my. So anyway, I bet, uh, Mr. Chairman, just one, one other quick question. Yes. I, have a, I have a concern about the 12 month waiting period. If a, if a family um, where the husband and wife works, but the husband is transferred to maybe a metro area and the mom decides, well, I'm not crazy about that school district or wherever they move, I think I'll homeschool. Well, the way that seasons work in cut sports, you could inadvertently sit a kid out for 16 months or 18 months, almost two years because or at a minimum, give them an opportunity to try out early to make the team. Sports, you know, school, school years are similar uh, from the end of school to the beginning. But some of these sports may be a fall wrestling sport. He decides to go in, all of a sudden he's got to wait 12 months. He or she has to wait until the, until the next season to make the cut to be in the sport and I'd like to try to figure out how we cover ourselves with that we're, we're good on that floor leader you know um, if you look on line 54 you know homeschool study students shall be eligible blah 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 okay so they're eligible and specifically talks about their resident school system resident school okay and what we're talking about when the withdrawal is from the resident school so that means if you're at Coffee County or at high school, you withdraw to be a homeschool student and within Coffee County, you're out for a year. And then after that, you're fine to be the, to take part in this. But if you, but if you move to a different town, you, you know, uh, what little I know about eligibility and everything, you're fine. That's a X move or Chuck Martin at, or maybe a, but, I got you. but you're good. If you relocate, you're eligible you're even under the current rules of public. Yes, sir. 
Yeah, you're good. Okay. They're 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 pretty good. They're good on that. Got you. <clears throat> okay, good. Uh, excuse number fifteen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so, are there any other differences in the substitute rather than uh, other than what uh, there, Representative a Wilson asked third about? Third one, ma'am. If you look over on line one seventeen, you know I had um, you know included for a one six segment, and then real being informed that, and I knew just didn't think about it. There are block scheduled schools that are on fourths, so that's why that's in there. Those are the only three. Okay, good. Um, and I uh, ask one more follow-up quick question so and I know we had heard in subcommittee about uh, the potential of um, I think G GHSA and the other group asked about possibly having local control the school board can opt in or out and this but that's not in the substitute no, is that correct? It's not. okay and and what was GHA's GS GHSA's position on this on the bill well, I, you know, I will not speak for them, but I think they were appreciative of the fact that we had worked hard on the bill. It's the best uh, bill that they had seen up to date, and, um, you know, I don't think that, uh, but earlier this year in a um, meeting, uh, they're, they're big, they voted it down, but that was in April before they saw this. So I don't think it would change, because I think there are some, just an attitude that some don't want change, and you know, that's time's moving on. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, number 11. Who's number 11? Okay, good. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, um, Mr. Chairman, um, I appreciate your work and your openness on this bill, we, and we talked about it in subcommittee the other day, um, and the concerns brought up were the potential of somebody, a student who's actually enrolled in the public school full-time being excluded from any extracurricular activity or team where um, there are just not enough spots. And um, I think that gives me pause. And so is there, is there um, any way that you feel that could be remedied where there would be at least some sort of uh, rating system or preference that would be given in that instance? Representative, I would hate to interject a quota into anything that we would do here. I think it should be based on ability and, um, and I think that's the, the way no normally especially cut sports are, are on ability and students and that you know, that is an issue that, that is out there that school systems and school boards will have to uh, deal with. Um, and Mr. Chair, if I may ask mm -hmm. one more question. This did, this did not occur to me in sub the other day, but um, as I was reading the bill, um, when a home, stu stu uh, home study student Tell me where you're at. Uh, on line 77 through 79, um, okay. I understand the, the, the age, academic, behavioral, conduct, immunization, all of those other things, but in terms of disciplinary, how would we carry out disciplinary actions that are conducted in, in schools right now, such as suspension or detention? Um, how would that be applied to a student who's actually not a full-time? Well, I think if they, if they put you in in-school suspension for your bad behavior, mm -hmm. that, you, that you as a parent have agreed to be part of this system and you'll take little Ricky and set him in in-school <laughs> suspension. <laughs> what about, I mean, out, I mean, what about out of school suspension? Pardon, Pardon me? I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Um, so that would work with detention, but then out of school suspension would be essentially the equivalent of staying at home. Certainly. <laughs> Good. Thank, Which thank is you. already happening. <laughs> okay. uh, thank you. Number 26. Oh, most of my questions have been answered here, but uh, one, one that I want to clarify would be on line 71 about uh, the, the completion of the course and passing one qualified course. So, so held to the same standards academically for that class as all other students. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And then uh, let, let, let's uh, dive a little deeper if we can into the um, – local control have you thought about the allowing of uh, school systems to choose yes i have and um of course you know because uh 
that's school systems number one or not their number one desire I think the number one desire is us to do nothing um, but I think yeah it's true I mean the um, and I have a hard time with that but I but I understand that and I'm you know that school systems would like to um, have choice you know and we're very I mean the legislature in the last 10 years I've been here as education policy has been very pro do as you wish uh, world I mean we really went that way and be responsible for your own thing so I mean my gut is I didn't like that but you know this is one of those um, you're sitting in front of a committee and if there's somebody want to do something different that's just a, that's whatever that's part of it all right thank you number 23 thank you mr. chairman chairman Jaspers first and foremost thank you and I mean that um, I know you're very passionate about I'm this. very passionate about Tebow um, <laughs> Tebow sorry I had to get it in uh, double gator um, the in all seriousness I, I do believe that I, I believe the ethos that we should all follow is putting the child at the center of every decision we make and by by that ethos if you believe that ethos I, I think we're hitting a balance here um, I do have just four, and I promise, committee, very quick questions or just clarification oh, questions, yeah, sir. Yeah, you know. um, real quick, on line 40, I just want to reiterate what uh, Representative Larikia said. I am concerned about the middle schoolers being excluded. I know in my county that the middle school is a school-sponsored sports bands and things versus I know in some counties they're club sponsored, so I'm not quite sure how that's going to work. I just wanted to note that for the chair. On line 46, forgive me, I was trying quickly to get on LexisNexis. Um, I just want to be clear, is the qualifying online school, a kind of course, pardon me, is it just high school courses through the district virtual school in the state, or could a university or dual enrollment course count as number six in terms of qualifying online course? I kept it as the virtual school from their, our state, and, so, and then many of them, representative have their own virtual school even Pickens County has their own so I kept okay. it there because my goal is to for Ricky to be part of X school okay thank you uh, and finally and on number three and I apologize I'll just go ahead and scratch four because representative Irvin asked it is Irwin excuse me on three I just want to be clear that I understand and it's and it's a tie between line 71 and line 97 when we talk about completing and passing so that means you know a course may take 12 13 14 15 16 weeks am i reading this correct that because participation includes to representative larickia's points tryouts off-season practice and things like that so with say football and band which typically has a spring tryout period for a fall sport or extracurricular we would be asking an eighth grader to finish and pass in the fall of their eighth grade year. I, I just want to make sure that I'm reading yeah, it correct. Yes, that's uh, my intent. Yes, okay. Sir. All right. Yes, Thank sir. you so much. Yes, sir. All right. Thank and you. They're going to have to plan ahead, Representative. I think it's it's not. Yeah, they got to plan ahead. Again, I, I'm casting no dispersion. Yeah, I'm oh, just, yeah. Sure that, I, uh, that I understand. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you. Number 19. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you so much for bringing this. Uh, I actually uh, had this experience this year, and there's a student that's sitting at home now that the team was excited, the student was excited, the school was okay with it, uh, thinking that she was gonna be able to play tennis this year only to be told at the last minute that because of uh, policies that she could not play. And so I certainly appreciate you doing this. So I got a couple of uh, quick questions. The first is that if I'm not mistaken, the parents of the school the homeschooler, are they subject to the same federal, state, and local taxes as any other parent? Sure. Absolutely. I would think so. Thank yes, you sir. so much. The second question, or second part of that question is, are those taxes used to build facilities, <laughs> sports facilities, et cetera, et cetera, uh, with that taxpayer's dollars is that correct yes sir and those students or our students as well as any other students is that correct yes sir. they just parent parents just choose uh, to homeschool their students mm -hmm. 
And last question, Mr. Chairman, uh, this does include the cyber student, is that correct? A cyber student. Uh, virtual. Yes, well that, may, I don't know that we're asking the same question. Can you elaborate what you're asking? A, 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 a student that's maybe, what is it, Connections? Is it uh, Georgia Connections? Georgia Virtual is what I'm, what I'm asking. Uh, would this include a Georgia Virtual School student? I'm not, I don't know how to answer that question. We'd have to, uh, Legislative Council, do you have a? Okay, I'm with you now, right. So if that student, follow up, Mr. Chairman. So if that student uh, was a part of a LEA or charter school, whatever, they could not cross over to play uh, sports in another school system. Is that what I'm you're, understanding? You are, I would agree with you. You're correct. Is that something that we discussed, Mr. Chairman? I think excuse me for the rules of the committee uh, could you get up and discuss that Abs absolutely okay uh, I, I just want some clarity on this because take testimony from the I audience think, because I, I didn't ask for testimony Mr. Chairman. I don't know but the response Rick doesn't have so if to get a correct answer for you I want you to be satisfied. I think that if I can answer Mr. Glanton you know this is specifically for a homeschool student that wants to participate in a high school activity and you know if someone's in another school system as you're described they would not be eligible to, to go to be participate in another school system like two school systems at the same time gotcha i don't think that's an appropriate uh, method for this bill and, and i also add, think that that, in, that invites recruiting and all that other yeah. stuff too does that answer well. your you know it, it, it does okay. it does thank, thank you. you mr chair thank you for kind of getting me i have to get on the same page with you i'm sorry i didn't okay number 14. Chairman Jaspers, I forgot yes, to ask you earlier, why the requirement to, ha to be enrolled in an online course one semester prior to being able to participate? I just think it gives people their commitment and their uh, desire, and then, and then also helps them get in the school system, and they passed a class, passed a class before they participate. You know, represent, if you didn't do that, I could just do that, sign up for whatever, just to see how it would do. This makes a commitment that they're going to take a class, pass it, and then be a part of, the, be a part of that system, try out. They become part of the information system of that school. Uh, I think it's very important that there's this continuity that happens. Because this, this is a tender subject anyway. And it is not, I think what I tried to do was make it as communicative as smooth as I could. And that was one key part of it I thought of, and or just kind of added to, to do that. Thank you. Number 10. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Chairman Jassers. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm all about public education and not about making, you know, uh, and, and the improvement of public schools. I'm all about that. Um, and uh, Representative Wilson asked my question, but I just don't know what that quantifies. Uh, the the one online course is it? What what could that be? I mean, do they get to choose any course they want to take? No, ma'am. If you look online um, twenty eight, we describe core academic subjects being English, reading, language arts, math social studies and foreign language, science also, excuse me. Mm -hmm. 
those are the core ones. That's typically what we do for most um, scholarship calculations and things like that. So Thank it's you. very defined. And Thank I think, you. just to, I just want to answer too, I don't think this bill is in any way an attack on public education or, or dismisses the um, importance that we feel about public education. This is just adding a, a, a another facet to it. I, well, I, I understand that, um, but to me, when we make it easier for all other entities to participate in public school, I mean, a private school would, would have none of this, I'm sure. They would be like, are you crazy, right? But they'd be I'm talking to me. They'd be talking to me. Not I you. said I might be <laughs> crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, well, if, you're not, if you don't break, you, if you don't bend, you'll break. I mean, we're all crazy. Um, but, um, you know, I just, I just think the, the more and more we push the envelope towards, you know, everybody can cash in on public schools, then the only people that are going to be there are the ones that can't afford to go anywhere else. And that in itself really makes it where public schools are. Like well, I, want to, I want to just throw maybe deserted. a different, I want to throw maybe a different curve at you. I think, um, I was talking to a homeschool parent about this a few weeks ago in my district, and her concern more than anything, Representative, was that when little Ricky goes to <laughs> Piggins County High School to take the virtual class, then participates, hers was banned, that he's going to like it. Like he's going to like being around with those other kids. He's going to want to participate. And then she, her, I mean, it was a real fear that, that he may want to go to public school. It was a little right. bit of fear of hers. And yeah. I said, well, okay, I understand that, but you don't have to do this. I'm not saying you have to do this. I right. Mean, you, that this is just an opportunity. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The last question, number three. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman Justice, for all the work that you did on this particular bill. And anytime you're talking about non-traditional um, schools, there's always a, a uproar. Of people get a bubble in their stomachs. And um, and I just, for me, just basically a, a comment and a question is that when the parents who choose um, homeschool, when their children get of age to graduate um, and they apply for college, uh, what I guess the question would be, aren't they looking at the same almost similar requirements as if they had gone through the traditional school? And let me say why I asked that particular sure. question. Because we've been talking back and forth about, um, it's almost like we're isolating like those homeschool kids or other kind of special kids, almost the same conversation we have about charter school students. And so if homeschool kids are going to college as well, which means they had to go through, meet a certain criteria, testing and all of that, then why is it that it seems like we are um, separating them out when they want to participate um, in, in the traditional school setting? And to me, when you look at it overall, that makes for a good community as well. Because those kids that are homeschooled are usually kind of isolated at home. And then when they're able to participate in a traditional school setting with sports, that brings camaraderie, not just at the school, but even in the community. So for me, I support the bill because I look at the community setting uh, when it comes down to that. Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate it. Well, thank you. Uh, We've had all these questions, and uh, Chairman Jaspers has answered them. Uh, what is the pleasure of the committee? I have a motion to pass and a second. Any further discussion? I think at this time it would be appropriate to discuss the amendments. Is that correct? Okay. Number 26. I have an amendment I'd like to propose, Mr. Vice Chairman, about uh, allowing school choice. All right, go ahead. Or system choice would be a better term for this. Okay, go ahead. And so what is your amendment? <clears throat> Each local system uh, that elects to allow homeschool 
students to participate in extracurricular activities and interscholastic activities shall comply with the provisions of this code and would allow the uh, school systems thus to make that choice individually. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, so we've had the amendment. Oh. I can pass that out. I think you need to. Yes, if you would. Yet to. If you look right at the top. Let me get the correct posture before we proceed, okay? All right, uh, the amendment's been passed out. Do I have a second for the amendment? Second. There is a second for the amendment. Any further discussion? Okay, number, number three. Go ahead, number three. Uh, I have a point of order. Um, according to our rules, number five, it says if a member or bill sponsor intends to introduce a committee substitute, a copy must be delivered to the chairperson's office at least two hours prior to the scheduled meeting, preferably an electronic copy. And I just want to know that we receive it two hours before. Does this apply? Uh, Actually, this is an amendment, not a substitute. Okay. Thank you. All right, number 27. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to know if the author is friendly to the amendment or not. I'm, I'm sorry, say that again. I'd like to know if the author is friendly to this amendment. I, I would, you know, my bill did not have this in there, and um, yeah, I'm certainly, at, I would let y'all can vote on it. I mean, I guess mine is no, but um, I would just, uh, if committee can decide. As this, is a, this is a very important change. Um, it may change in the Senate going the other way. And, um, you know, I, I'm always pretty open about just free discussion, I mean, amongst our members. And um, I would let the, they can decide. Thank you. Did I leave anyone off? I think, uh, did number 27 push the button? No, oh, okay. Number 18. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My concern about this, and I would ask respectfully to, to my friend from Northeast Georgia, I, I would ask members to not adopt the amendment. My concern, my, my wife was a school counselor in rural Georgia. And uh, I think about the metro area. There's, there are opportunities in some areas, larger areas, for homeschool kids to have opportunities outside of the school system. But in small areas, the only opportunity to play sports or, and be involved in activities is the public school. Um, I just, I think, to have an equal opportunity for kids across the state, and we do have an obligation as a state to provide a free and adequate, adequate education for all kids. We don't, browse, we don't say in this district we have a less or more opportunity. I think the, the, the author's plan was to make sure that particularly in those small areas, there may only be one or two kids who want to do this. There, that's not a big enough constituency, perhaps, to win a school board vote. You can't, you can't fill a room in rural Georgia with the three kids who want to play or be involved in activities. Uh, you can maybe in a bigger area. I think in the areas that maybe there's only two or four, three or four kids who would want to do this, that's not enough constituency, perhaps, to win a school board vote. But those are the kids I think we need this, that need this bill more than anybody. And I would respectfully ask that we would not adopt the amendment. Thank you. Number 14. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would echo those sentiments of Chairman Setzler. 
I think that this amendment completely defeats the whole point of this bill. And if, if you know, to my colleagues who are, who are thinking local control, I would encourage you to look at this the way I'm looking at this. Um, <laughs> just think the way I do. Just think the way I do. No, but the, but the way I approach this, Mr. Chairman, is that uh, the homeschool families have paid their their taxes that are that are paying for 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 this, and this is this bill would allow them access to the programs that their taxes are going to. Thank Got you. It. Thank you. All right, number fifteen. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I I would like uh, just to confirm that that two of the three groups that spoke to this subcommittee um, suggested this would be an improvement to the bill. Is that right? the GHSA and then the superintendent are uh, Gale, Georgia Gale, Association of Education Leaders. Yes, right. ma'am. This the, those two groups asked for this. Yes, ma'am. They yes. did. Okay. Absolutely. They okay. Did. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Number sixteen. Thank you. And I just want clarity. Your intent is if the bill passes that the local school districts can adopt this uh, policy or not? Is that the intent? What number is he? What number are you, Chris? The, the intent would be to add to this bill that the school systems, the local school system, can make a choice to allow those students or not. Okay. And, and just for a point of clarity, when we I'm, a, I'm an accountant, so numbers are relevant to me. When we talk about funding uh, and, and parents are paying taxes, there are some local dollars. But when we talk QBE, we're not talking local dollars. So the QBE is funded per pupil, if I understand that correctly. So I think if we could have this conversation about students and, and not that the, the, the parents are paying the dollars, because that's not really true, and we think about it, our taxes do not pay for a quality education. They're, they're pooled. However, I do understand what it is you're trying, attempting to do, and I do believe that the local school district should be allowed, and I mean, I have no skin in the game. My youngest is in college, but we have constituents that we are representing, so I think if we're all going to really be fair and, and have the school, local, the homeschoolers to have the opportunity to participate, we should also give the local school districts the opportunity to say yay or nay. And, there's, and giving them that opportunity doesn't mean they're going to say no. Thank you. Number 19. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I just have a question for you. In regards to QBE, my good friend to my left, are QBE dollars tax dollars? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Also, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would, I would say that if we were to push this back to the locals to make decisions, particularly in districts where there's anti-charter, anti-virtual, anti-this, anti-that, that would basically gut what you're trying to do here in the intent and purpose of this bill. Is that not correct, Mr. Chairman? Uh, it might. You know, I think when I thought about um, choice after Representative Evans reminded me, I thought about it during the meeting the other day. It will until two counties have success in allowing some young person, as the person you talked about with tennis, has success and I think it will roll to others I think they would it would but there will always be the holdouts you're right so thank you mr. chairman and my intent is to vote no on this uh, amendment thank you uh, the last question is number 25 thank you, uh, thank you, mr. chairman there you go um, chairman Jasper is you aware of any other area where GHSA allows local districts to, to have their own rules that are different from the other districts GHSA allows their rules to be different. 
do they allow districts to have different rules, or do they uh, do they require oh, the entire state to operate under that one set of rules? Yeah, I, I don't know that answer, but I think uh, that the key thing, Chairman, is that that student has to participate, and if they are there, they're under the rules of the state. They're not a. Well, my suggestion is if we allow each district to do that, we're allowing that. We're allowing there to be different rules for different no, districts for no, under sir. GHSA. I would, I would say that's not true because that. Well, some would have homeschool and some would not. How's that not, I don't understand how that's not well, different. I think that the, the person who is um, participating will follow all the rules of the school system. And that means being involved with and following the rules of Georgia High School. And but the ones who are not doing it, they are still following all the rules. Of Georgia. Right, I understand. I'm not saying they're not following the rules, but we're allowing a different set of rules for one district than another district. Well, I think we're allowing to be eligible for a GHSA. Yeah, right. I think we're allowing other additional children. I don't know. That, I don't know that I agree with that uh, line. Thing, okay, that's fair enough. That's okay. I'm concerned. Uh, I'm going to vote no on this, with all respect to my friend here on this amendment, because I do think it creates a competitive advantage. And, uh, and we're gonna have a state championship where there's gonna be a bunch of complaining after the fact, well, they came from a district that allowed homeschoolers and, and they didn't, and it gave them an advantage. Also, we know, we know where the superintendents lie on this bill. There's gonna be an enormous peer pressure applied by GHSA and the school leadership to, for districts not to enact this policy. So I don't think it's a, I, I think we're setting ourselves up for a, a a can of worms if right. we I, just, I would allow also add, to represent chairman that um after that success that you just described that someone had the others would come along but by the i think it's the second <laughs> monday night or tuesday night of the next month school board meeting <laughs> i think you're right about that all right great the appropriate time now is for us to vote we have a motion and a second we had discussion and this is on a uh, representative Irwin's. uh AM 490002 amendment to Chairman Jasper's sub. All right, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed signify by saying no. No. Yeah, well, I think uh, the no's have it, so the amendment fails. Uh. Oh, we have to do a hand. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Pleasure of the chairman, according to the I was taught what? Okay. Again, let's let's do it again. Uh, all those in favor of the amendment signify by raising their hand. Two, four. I got four. Uh, four yeses. Five yeses. Sorry. Five. Okay. Now, all those opposed, please raise your hand. The amendment fails. Thank you. All right. Uh, is there any uh, other amendments that need to be brought before the committee? Mr. Chairman, I had considered uh, moving that six to eight, but I think I'll leave it at six. So I will not make an amendment to do that. You will not make an amendment. Right. Okay. So now it's to the main motion, and that is. LC 490214S. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Cole. Yeah. All right. There's been a motion and a second and discussion, so now it's time to vote. All those in favor of uh, this, uh, this bill, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. No. Okay. Well, another show of hands will be necessary. All right. All those in favor of, just to be uh, clear, LC 490214S, signify by saying aye. Oh, yeah. I mean, no, raise your right hand, I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll do both. Ten. Was that correct? Uh, Keep your hands sorry. up, please. <laughs> Almost got her. <laughs> nine. Nine. Okay. All those opposed, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So nine to seven. So 
The uh, the bill passes, receives the new pass designation. Is there any further business before the committee? Seeing none, we're adjourned. Can I make just one announcement, Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Be looking. We are going to attempt to have a, another a meeting on Tuesday. We're going to be working that. There's some folks that want to have it. Some bills heard, and we're going to work to try to get that done on Tuesday. So be looking for a, an announcement. Thank you. Thank you, committee. Oh. I didn't need to vote or should I?